namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa aparutha de sangamathasthavara e sorvandha bhamunjantu satang So this uh, splendid autumn day, and uh, my time here in uh, Temple Forest Monastery is getting closer to the end. In a couple of weeks or three weeks, I'll go back to England. And so to reiterate the purpose of these talks, uh, reflections, they encourage all of us to practice following the teachings of the Lord Buddha. Because we can, worldly dhammas are very powerful and uh, there's so much confusion everywhere uh, here in the United States and the UK is going through a very complicated political time and economic problems. So the world and the war in Ukraine and on and on like that, you hear of reports in African countries. Who's content? Who's satisfied with anything? You know, and... Uh, this discontentment, dissatisfaction is the way that we've been educated to conceive of better possibilities for our lives, taking everything very personally, <clears throat> seeing uh, that the, what one believes one is is so important, or even to think that you're totally unimportant. So this illusion of a separate self means that contentment and satisfaction you can't find in the world <clears throat> because it's constantly changing and no matter how, how the political system might be, the religious teachings that you ascribe to, you know, as long as one is grasping the conventions, even no matter how good the conventions are, <clears throat> then we, that's the way to be discontented. Because one can always imagine the future holds something better. Or we, as you get older, then you reflect on the past. And so, you know, you find people remembering the past and the good old days in the United States. And uh, I can't remember good old days. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I've had a lot of time living and then when I chanted the Aparutade Sangamatasa Taura, the gate to the deathless is open. <clears throat> and then the Buddha says, Ye Soda Vandaba Munjandu Satang, it means trust in this, this, this simple statement of the Buddha in this Theravadan tradition. <clears throat> so the gate to the deathless. What, what is that? You know, it's, it's words and uh, 
the American culture doesn't talk about deathless, except they want to live forever, immortality on a physical level, which is totally impossible. But the deathless, then is to trust in that the gate to the to the deathless is open for those who are listening, trust in this statement. It's proclamation, in fact. And then what is the deathless in terms of, you know, can you imagine deathlessness? Can you create images of deathlessness? And, and you can't. You know, it's, it's beyond imagination. It's not an image, it's a reality that we realize through awareness. And it's in trusting this awareness, awareness of the way it is, that right now in this present moment is like this, just that simple reminder So, like, when we take refuge in Dhamma, you know, what do we mean by that? And, uh, you know, we're quite willing to chant the Pali words or Thai words and, <clears throat> and uh, believing there's something called Dhamma, but it also is apparent here and now, timeless. So it's a word that conveys the reality, ultimate reality, absolute reality that we take refuge in. So when we reflect on that, the, the absolute reality of this moment is conscious consciousness. Everybody is experiencing consciousness here and now. So we don't take refuge in consciousness, but in Dhamma, <clears throat> in this, in these formula, formulaic traditions that we inherited in this tradition. But consciousness is apparent here and now, because you know you're conscious. That's a fact that you can't deny any of you, you can't deny that you're conscious right now. You might be thinking about other things or trying to figure out what that means, but when the direct question, are you conscious now, you have to say yes. So that's apparent for every one of us. Conscious and awareness here and now, or Dhamma, so there's Dhamma, there's consciousness. Consciousness then couldn't possibly, couldn't manifest forms if there was no space. So there's consciousness, space, and then the forms that manifest in space made of earth, fire, water, and air, elements that have form, that have qualities. So just this simple outline is important to, to investigate. Conscious awareness, Dhamma is our refuge, consciousness is here and now, space, and then forms manifest in space. And so the suffering we experience is always attachment to the forms. So some of the forms, they can have any, all kinds of qualities, good and bad, right and wrong. And so bodies are forms, and we have strong uh, conditioning to identify with our physical body. And we're conditioned to to believe that we are this limited form because we've never 
reflected on reality here and now, we've been culturally conditioned to believe that our true nature is a, a physical form, a condition of some sort, it can be healthy, unhealthy, male or female, black or white, and you know, these forms have different qualities. But they all arise in space and in, con in space and consciousness. So, what, what, how, what is your true identity then? These changing conditions that we've been told to believe in, that our, our reality, the real world that we live in. You know, so being a Buddhist monk, you know, and living in a non-Buddhist country, people keep, you know, they say, why are you escaping the real world? And so, you know, it's a question that, that many people, non-Buddhist people, believe the real world is the world they've created in their minds, they've been conditioned to believe in. And then we tend to, you know, they have these these kind of biased images of monks meditating or yogis contemplating their navels and not getting married, not paying their taxes, <laughs> not getting a mortgage, or <laughs> and, and we're kind of copping out on life by living in in. Uh, forests, like here at Temple Forest Monastery. But the real world, you know, I had that, I uh, believed the real world was that type of conditioning, because that's how I was brought up, to believe in, in what I'd been conditioned to believe in. You didn't have much choice, you know, as when you're a child, you're innocent, you're open, you just kind of, you're like a sponge, you absorb everything. You don't reflect if it's true or false, yeah. But what your parents tell you, what the society tells you, what the religion tells you, you, you tend to believe that. But Dhamma is reality itself, here and now. So if you're going to identify with something, identify with that. Because that's not personal. It's not, you're not conditioned to be, as a person, to be conscious. It's natural. Consciousness is part of nature. Dhamma. So when you really, and this is something that isn't, you know, I expect you to believe, but to reflect upon, to find out what you really are. And that's the whole point of the Buddhist teaching, is, is signs, pointers, to ultimate reality, to conscious awareness here and now, gate of the deathless. <clears throat> and the death, what is death then, but about the four elements? Because they're changing, they're subject, they can manifest or disappear. And they have all kinds of qualities, dualistic qualities from heaven to hell to right and wrong, true and false. And so you can see the conflicts that a society like this country has because it's full of views and opinions. People's identities are very personal, they take very, person, take very personally. And political correctness is the word of the day to not offend anybody by giving them the wrong name or the, not qualifying them properly because we believe we are the things we 
we believe in, that we believe we are. And then you, it's not that you discredit that, but it is conditioning. It's not natural phenomena, deathless, apparent here and now, timeless. It's all about time, birth and death, right and wrong, good and bad, about heaven and hell. And that you, you aren't born with those thoughts in your mind. They're not, they're, they're uh, made up conventions that all societies, you know, have different ways, cultural identities, different class identities, gender identities are all made up to think that one is a human body. So human bodies populate the planet Earth at this time. They're the most dominant species of conditions. And then the problems that arise from that, from being a dominant species where most of this human species believe in their version of the real world, what they've been conditioned to believe in. They don't take refuge in Dhamma, they take refuge in the conditions they've acquired. So it's like going back to the source. They oftentimes talk about, we oftentimes talk about going to the source, which is conscious awareness. And so consciousness has no birth or death. And it depends on forms to manifest. So we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, we have a brain, mind, and you know, consciousness doesn't have a language. It's totally impersonal. And so it, you know, it can't be, you can't, uh, you know, people try desperately to describe consciousness. Psychologists, scientists of the modern age are trying to figure out what consciousness is. Is it the brain or, uh, you know, is, do giraffes have, con are they conscious? Or, you know, we have certain biases that only human beings are conscious. But all forms are manifestations in consciousness, whether they're giraffes or human, human beings. So consciousness is unitive. It doesn't prefer anything like preferring human beings to giraffes. It's not the, the you know, it doesn't think it, it doesn't have thoughts. But it's where space and forms can operate. And just reflecting, if there was no consciousness, there couldn't be any space. And if there's no space, there's no forms. And we identify with the lowest denomination, the form, Nobody identifies with space. And consciousness is what you actually are. This universal ultimate reality is to be realized, each one for themselves. So when we chant to be bhajatang way tidapa we 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 realize, you know, the Buddhist teachings are skillful means that we can use that are still excellent pointers at what is apparent here and now, timeless. And so this is, you know, in this is, in monastic life is a whole, uh, you know, you have, you're devoting your, 
your time to this reality. That's the purpose of, of Buddhist monastic samanas. And so, you, you know, you're dependent, you don't have a job, you're dependent on generosity, and, and it's a, a trust in this awareness, in conscious awareness, which doesn't seem like anything when you try to find it or think about it. But as you relax and just open to the present moment, you can't find it through effort. You can't realize it. It's not something you find, but something you realize is real. And when you use a lot of effort to realize Dhamma, then you're operating from the self-view. That you're, you're somebody who has to get the Dhamma or realize the ultimate reality or get enlightened, whatever words you prefer. So just that assumption that, that you are the body, the physical body, and operating like even as a Buddhist monk, thinking that and that I'm ordained in order to, as a person, to realize Dhamma, gets in the way, the sense that, that I'm somebody who's trying to realize Dhamma. Because what you realize through following these teachings of the Buddha is that you're not anything. You're not a thing. And that's the liberation, that's the deathless reality that we are capable of, of realizing for ourselves. And yet you can still live in the world, operate in, in, uh, in uh, ignorant worldly conditions that we live in, without the delusion that you are uh, the conditions that you've been conditioned by, the identities, the worldly identities, the traditional identities, cultural identities are, are merely conditions that you realize have no soul, no purpose other than living life in, in a form is like this. So trust is, is not about belief. It's not believing in Buddhism. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's not about doctrinal positions that we take about the, that, you know, whether there's God or not God or, or you know, the word Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha are not personal terms. So we take refuge in the Sangha, those who practice rightly, who according, you know, the, realize the deathless themselves. And this realization takes place in relaxed attention to the present moment. It's like, that's why we use these words, it's like this, because it's, it's, it's not a description of anything, it's just a sign pointing at here and now, it can only be this way, that awareness. Whatever you're aware of can, can be different from one person to the next. But conscious awareness is finding what you really are, you're the deathless reality that the Buddha was pointing to in his first sermon, The Four Noble Truths. And the deathless reality is silent. It has no language. 
the best word you can you describe it is silence. Behind all the noise, behind all the forms, or supporting all the forms, all the noise of the world, is a silent awareness. So if you're always operating from a separate self position, like my practice, my meditation, Uh, you know, then we, we're caught in clinging to traditional forms or views about practice or Buddhism. But that very clinging to views about anything is the cause of suffering, is clinging, attachment, out of ignorance. So the insight is to let go of the forms, to see that they are impermanent, unsatisfactory. And so when we take refuge in forms, you know, we're attaching to something that's in the process of change. It has no stability. And that's why we're frightened and anxious and worried because our identity depends on trying to hold on to ideas or conditions whose very nature is changing here and now. There's no stability in the what they call the real world. It's all, you know, with, uh, I remember a, when they established the United Nations after the Second World War, you know, ideally we thought this is a really good idea where the United Nations will be a wise group of people to get together, on, you know, all countries are represented, and we will be able to not have any more wars because we're all reasonable, intelligent people that want peace and stability from the changing conditions that we're blind to. So at the time of the UN was established, I was about 11 or 12 years old. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that's really, you know, a wonderful idea to have the whole world united in a group that that meets, that has uh, representatives to resolve conflicts and that, that we can do through reason, being reasonable, sensible, peace-loving beings. Well, that's very idealistic. That's, that's what we'd like it to be. That's how it should be. According to ideas, we should just learn to get along and help each other in the economies with the politics and bring peace to the world and keep everything under control through wise leadership conventions like the United Nations. So then in my life, I've met people working for the United Nations and they say it's not very peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> because it's you know it's a it's an ideal it's a good idea no question of that but how can you unite when people are so different in their conditioning their cultural biases their egos the sense of their separateness whether they're extroverts or introverts whether they're men or women, you know, they, there's all kinds of identities that we thoroughly committed to defending that are in conflict with other identities. So that's why the world at this time is confused. Because as much as we have good ideas about how to resolve conflict, 
how do you resolve conflict when each group think they're right and the other's wrong? So on the worldly level, it's about right and wrong, true and false. And that's the nature of phenomena, of conditions. It's, you know, the conditions are, we believe are right, and if you don't agree with me, then you're wrong. It seems logical, makes sense. On the reasonable level, because reason is a function of language. You know, the Dhamma, conscious awareness, isn't about right and wrong doesn't judge, doesn't pass judgments, doesn't hold views about how things should be. But individual human beings do. And masses of human beings believe in in what's right and what's wrong. So in the 1950s, in my youth, there was a McCarthyism, in which the United States turned desperately against communism, Soviet Russia, and there was tremendous paranoia when I was in university uh, about communists uh, under uh, reds under the beds, and so. <laughs> And this, this was great news, uh, you know, t- television was coming into fashion then. And so, you know, the news about pe- many people were, were destroyed by this, by suspicion, by blame. Because to the American propaganda, communism is wrong and democracy is right. Now these are views You know, what is communism, what is democracy in reality? When, you know, they're ideas, good ideas. But to this day, communism or socialism in this country are wrong and democracy is right. So this is, this we tend to, when politicians blame the other being communists, You know, it's because they don't agree with someone else's idea of democracy. What are they doing? They're grasping ideas, prejudice, which prejudices them towards the reality of their own humanity. And so we fight over that. Wars still take place. There's so many wars going on on this planet at this time. Things like in Africa, Europe. So, just to point out that Dhamma isn't judgmental. Because it doesn't, it, judgments are about conditions, about qualities. Is black better than white? Or red better than blue? You know, it's a matter of opinion. It's not, they're not absolutely right or wrong. They are what they are. But some people prefer red over blue. That's a personal preference. It's not an absolute right. It's personal. It's, it's condition. It's bias. The ego is the big obstacle, the sense of the separateness. And yet we can be aware of the ego. The ego, you can't can't be aware of itself. So the ego is conditioned, so it can be very righteous, you know, all about how things should be, how what's right, what's moral, what's good, what everybody should believe in. And and they're right in many ways, but that attachment to being right is out of delusion, out of ignorance. 
we should end wars. We should learn how to get along. With, we should resolve conflicts with reason and logic. But is the world, the real world, as in quotes, is that really right or wrong? You know, it varies from one individual to the next. So passing judgment is a function of conditioning. It, you know, so reason and logic are about language. When we get into Dhamma, it's not about language anymore. It's about awareness, here and now. Where the awareness of right and wrong isn't taking sides. Right, being righteous, feeling righteous and, and, and virtuous is like this, or feeling unworthy and wrong is like this. And that is awareness of whatever feelings you may be having in the present, what the identities that you cling to, you begin to see are illusions that you create. They're not ultimate reality. So if there's no right and wrong, good or bad, you know, the conditioned realm is all about skillful, unskillful, right and wrong, good or bad. But the deathless is not doesn't have views, doesn't have words for heaven and hell, male or female. So consciousness, because it's impersonal, not culturally biased, is when we talk about awareness, conscious awareness, it's the gate or the door to the deathless. And that's available to all of us always here and now when you begin to realize that for yourself. So this is, you know, this is the escape from the perplexities of all the conditioning we've received. It's complicated now. People have all kinds of identities and beliefs. Reason and logic are greatly admired and held up as, you know, what's right. That we should be reasonable and fair. There should be justice, rule of law, order, respect. All these are right. But can you force these qualities on populations? Can you make people believe in these views that you hold are right? Through what means can you make them do it? Through compulsion, through punishment, through, through uh, fear, anxiety? You know, you push idealism onto a population of individual conditions. You know, they... Uh, taking the righteous view, then there's just, you know, you feel oppressed by ideals like communism or democracy. No matter what you call it, no matter what kind of ideal word you have for what is right and fair and just, if it's forced on individuals, what do you feel? When you're being forced, compelled, bullied into believing in that my view is the right one and you, you should believe it, and I reject you, I punish you if you don't believe it, that is tyranny. So we use tyranny, fear, as a way to punish people who don't conform to one's particular view of what's right. So attachment to ideals is out of ignorance, it's not out of wisdom. 
we're letting go of conditions is where wisdom operates. Wisdom isn't about re being reasonable, it's about knowing the way things are here and now. That all conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma, Dhamma is not personal. So right and wrong, good and bad, true and false, is the world, the created world, the illusory world. And the perplexity of modern life, because they're increasingly well-educated with all kinds of modern miracles, technological miracles, modern science, all based on reason and logic, on looking at things through the microscope, through the telescope, giving qualities to, to different conditions that are perceived through special means, wanting to send people to the moon to live on the moon or Mars. You know, these uh, people believe in alien forces. And so, you know, this is, people have actually seen aliens. So they believe that aliens are real. And most of us have never seen an alien. So aliens don't seem very real to me. <laughs> who's right and who's wrong? Am I saying they're wrong because they've actually seen an alien? You know, and that's just superstition. I can make value judgments about it because I haven't seen aliens. So, uh, you know, if I haven't seen them, then if you see them, you're something wrong with your mind is a value judgment, isn't it? It's me deciding that if you are being totally reasonable, just like I am, then you'll agree with me. <laughs> but whether you see aliens or not, if you see aliens, there's still impermanent conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, Reality of Dhamma still applies to madness, to illusion, to all possibilities, whether it's materialism or spiritualism. You know, then this is what I've always appreciated about Buddha Dhamma is that, you know, the statement, all conditions are impermanent. So in Theravada Buddhism, you have a cosmology, you have Deva worlds and Brahma worlds, and <clears throat> so you have this, this kind of fascinating cosmology. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, some people believe in, in, in Deva, some people see Devas or Brahmas, or Virgin Mary, or Jesus, you know, and are we, you know, is, should I say you're, it's an illusion, a delusion of your mind? If you actually see something like that? But is it Dhamma, is it permanent? One year I was visiting a shrine in Portugal, a Fatima shrine. And it's a, some peasant children saw the Virgin Mary in this particular place in central Portugal. And uh, it's become an international shrine for, they built cathedral, uh, basilica, and all kinds of, if thousands of Catholics go there every year. And so, you know, is that, you know, to me, my intellectual mind is, you know, all this is nonsense. That's how I've been conditioned to see things like that. But awareness 
of I'm thinking this is nonsense, that I trust, not my prejudiced view, my conditioned view about the nature of Our Lady of Fatima, you know, that I'm right and all the rest of people are ignorant. So even we can be perfectly rational, intelligent, scientific about everything and still be deluded, ignorant, lacking wisdom in understanding ultimate reality. So I offer this for today's reflection.